Hello, and once again, uh, welcome to Entertainment Public Relations. And uh, we're going to talk this time about Entertainment Public Relations as a subfield of Public Relations and the Entertainment Public Relations process. So, we already talked about the definition of Public Relations. So, by now, you are experts in uh, uh, official definition of public relations as a strategic communication process that builds mutually beneficial relationships between organization and their publics. So this definition by PRSA is the cornerstone of uh, uh, public relations and especially if you decide to get accreditation in public relations, if you decide to become APR accredited public relations professional, you definitely should know this definition. Even in the middle of the night, you should be able to wake up and cite uh, uh, this definition word by word. So, how do we take this definition and apply it to entertainment public relations? And it, turns, it turns out that it is pretty simple because entertainment public relations is a subset of public relations. So, the entertainment public relations would sound like a definition of entertainment public relations can sound something like that. Entertainment public relations is a strategic communication process that builds mutually beneficial relationships between entertainment organizations and their publics. Not that different. The question is then, what are entertainment organizations and what are their publics. Strategically, the processes may be the same, but entertainment public relations may have its own unique tactics. It may also have its own unique goals and objectives. But the concept overall is the same. It is still public relations. So, what kind of entertainment organizations we can be talking about when we talk about entertainment public relations? Theater, right? One of the oldest original concepts of entertainment when we still had uh, cavemen uh, uh, perhaps sitting in the, caves, uh, in the caves and they wanted to tell a story about how the hunt recently went. They might stand up and play out what they were doing, what the animal was doing, or uh, how they got scared when the lightning uh, struck nearby. They may reenact all that, and so that may be the foundation of the theater. Uh, later, they maybe started drawing on the walls, and so we got uh, art, we, we, we got painting, uh, which actually I don't have on my list, uh, embarrassingly for me. Uh, so, art is a very big deal in uh, entertainment public relations as well, and many paintings sell for millions of dollars. Uh, so, it is a big a part of entertainment public relations. Eventually, as technology developed, new types of uh, uh, entertainment public relations industries appeared. Radio, movies, TV, music. I guess music should go as early as a theater, as uh, the cavemen were drumming on the rocks. Uh, and perhaps there were some who drummed better than the others and they became early celebrities. And that's another subset of entertainment public relations. Celebrities, managing celebrities, promoting celebrities also existed for centuries, although the term, the term itself, celebrity, is not as, uh, um, as old. But uh, there were athletes, athletes being celebrated as celebrities thousands of years ago in uh, um, ancient civilizations. Um, uh, sports, again, going back to ancient civilizations, sports is one of the uh, early types of entertainment public relations. Olympic Games dating back and, the, you know, where uh, um, Olympic Games happening now, but they also been happening thousands of years ago. Uh, a gaming, be it a, a Monopoly table game or a computer game or um, a, a console game like Xbox or Sony PlayStation or Nintendo. Uh, to the mobile games that we all have on our phones. Uh, fashion, uh, public relations, travel and tourism, and so on and so on and so forth. Um, as the um, human civilization progressed, we created, we are creating more and more ways for 
entertaining and you know you can say that well in the past uh, uh, humans had to fight for their survivals 23 out of 24 hour day and so there was not that much time for entertainment and then eventually we got we earned more and more free time in 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 our lives and we went from fighting for survival 23 hours a day to uh, maybe 16 hour work days or 18 hour work days and then eventually 12 hour work days now it's typically eight hour work days so we have more and more times freeing up in our lives for entertainment and entertainment expands it you know they <laughs> we cannot have an empty space in our life so entertainment expands to occupy it as much time as we're willing to give it as much time as we're willing to uh, have free time other than sleep and work and whatever other responsibilities we may have and so entertainment public relations is obviously catching up with that and it's a growing industry more and more uh, uh, promotion publicity is required to provide services to all these growing venues of entertainment public relations PRSA Public Relations Society of America recognizes the uniqueness and the importance of entertainment public relations. In fact, PRSA has professional interest sections for unique specializations of public relations. For example, I myself as a member of the financial communication section because of my uh, former uh, work and my current research in the field of financial communication and investor relations. And PRSA has several, actually, sections dedicated to subfields of entertainment public relations. There is an, uh, a professional interest section called entertainment and sports. So a lot of the entertainment public relations professionals belong to the entertainment and sports uh, PRSA professional interest section. Travel and tourism is recognized as its own professional interest section. Some might say, well, that travel and tourism is part of entertainment, uh, but Travel and tourism is a very significant uh, part of the promotional and public relations industry. A lot of the countries have their own travel and tourism bureaus trying to bring businesses or trying to bring investments or trying to bring tourists to their particular countries. If you, especially if you go to the traditional vacation destinations like Spain or the Barbados or Bahamas or uh, Jamaica, uh, they would have their own travel and tourism bureaus that have significant money, significant resources to attract whatever they're trying to attract in, in most cases uh, tourists, but in some cases it may be businesses or uh, uh, investments in the company or even long-term residents. Uh, Costa Rica is famous for trying to bring long-term residents to the uh, uh, country from the United States and Canada. Um, so it is a very significant industry and that's why PRSA has a separate professional interest section for travel and tourism. And PRSA also have a related professional interest section called technology interest section where many people working in the technology side of entertainment PR industry such as um, uh, for example video gaming or mobile gaming uh, may be interested in being members to, again, share their unique experience and gain advantage. And again, depending upon what kind of entertainment public relations you are working in, you may have slightly different tactics, slightly different goals and objectives uh, um, that are required for you to achieve for your company, for your industry. Uh, but the overall concept of public relations, what is your responsibility and what it is you are doing, is going to be still similar. So now, as we talked about the definition of public relations, we should talk about the public relations process. What it is we exactly do as public relations professionals.
So we talked about the definition of public relations and as a result the definition of entertainment public relations. So now it's time to quickly go back to reviewing the public relations process itself. So traditional public relations process according to PRSA consists of four letters. R, P, I, and E, R, P, I, E. R stands for research, P stands for planning, I stands for implementation, and E stands for evaluation. Uh, depending upon the textbook you are using, there are different acronyms used to describe it. So there is another popular one is uh, ROPES, Research, Objectives, Planning, Evaluation, Stewardship, Races, ROSI, but the idea is the same. There are four step process and the idea of the four step process is the foundation of all public relations. We always start with research. We need to know the starting point. We need to know what the problem is that prevents us reaching where we want to be. And we need to develop a roadmap how to get there. So this, without research, we cannot do that. Then, once we know the starting point, we plan how to go around the problem. We plan the objectives. We, we now know where we are now, so we kind of can extrapolate what we can do based on how much time we have for the campaign, how much money we have for the campaign, we can now figure out where we can end up. So we set in the goal, we set in the objectives for ourselves, we're developing tactics that help us get from where we are now to where we want to be. Then we actually implement, so we develop the timeline, when we're going to do, what tactic, how much money we're going to invest, how, ma how much uh, resources we're going to invest, how much time we're going to invest. Um, the, 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 and we implement whatever it is we're planning. And then once it's done, we evaluate, so we measure the results. And when we talk about evaluation, we always talk about that evaluation should be done, not just what public relations can do, meaning the output of public relations, but also the influence on the, our target audience, the outcomes, and of course we need to measure the influence on the business results, so the actual final outgrowth, how did it affect the organization, what did we do, the output, the outcome, and the outgrowth, and uh, um, uh, uh, what is the end result of the campaign. And um, several public relations practitioners are also saying that there should be the fifth step, and many textbooks actually talk about the five-step process of public relations, which is S, stewardship, meaning what it is we do between the active campaigns. If we, let's say, create a new uh, iPhone and we had an amazing campaign to increase its sales and now the campaign is over, people bought it, what do we do to keep them happy? Uh, the support, maybe, you know, the uh, implementing software updates, maybe providing some unique content for just iPhone uh, owners. So stewardship is maintaining your current relationships so that when it's time to start a new campaign, you don't have to start from scratch. This is a cyclical uh, process. There is a cycle from research planning, implementation, evaluation, stewardship, and it goes back to the new campaign because it's easier to sell a new iPhone to somebody who already had an iPhone and enjoyed it rather than somebody who is using Android or Windows phone or whatever else is out there. Um, and so you need to maintain the relationship. Your current customer can generate as much or even more value than the new customer you're going to bring, bring from outside. So this is the traditional 
public relations process. Uh, this is what we always talk about when we talk about public relations process. And since entertainment public relations is part of the public relations, the entertainment public relations process looks like that. It is the same. When you work in the entertainment public relations, you still start with research. You need to know who is potentially your target audience for your movie or the music album or the uh, um, art exhibit, whatever it is it might be. You need to identify uh, what um, communication channels to use to reach them, what is the best way to reach them, and so on and so forth. You always start with research. Then you go to planning and the same way as in traditional public relations, the same as in entertainment public relations, you do develop your goals, objectives, strategies, tactics, and the same way you focus on the key points. You start with awareness because you want people to know about your movie, art exhibit, music album, whatever it is. Without knowing about this, people cannot uh, uh, enjoy it if they don't even know about it. Then you go to attitude, you want them to like it, you want them to want it, you want them to buy the music album or go to an art exhibit or watch a movie. And then finally, it's action. So three A's, awareness, attitude, action. Sometimes action is called behavior, but I don't like it because then it's not three A's. So it's better to have three A's. So you want people to act in an actual way. You don't want them to just want to watch a movie, you want them to actually go buy a ticket and watch the movie. So generate the actual business result. And then for each of your objective, you develop specific strategies. What is the best way to have somebody know about a new music album? Is it social media? Maybe it's traditional media. Maybe it's a, a music publication. Maybe it's radio. Uh, a common way to do it. And then the specific tactics. If it's a radio, then what kind of, uh, what exactly uh, radio maybe what kind of uh, a show on the radio, uh, what song out of the album you would be uh, letting them play and so on and so forth. If you want the action, maybe it's a coupon code to go to an art exhibit. Maybe it's uh, um, inviting local um, schools to an art exhibit. Whatever it is, whatever tactic you can come up with to support your strategies that would then help you achieve your objectives. Then implementation, when you actually do it, you have the calendar, you have the gun chart, uh, you have the budget, uh, and you implement your entertainment public relations. Then the evaluation, the output, what you did as a public relations person, outreach, how much the message actually spread, the outcome, what was the influence on the ta uh, target public outgrowth, what was the final business result, and then outperform how it compares with previous activities. And uh, again, we're going to talk about it in the actual class on evaluation. And then finally, stewardship, how you maintain relationship. If let's say you did Back to the Future Part 1, you know, what do you do to have people who enjoy Back to the Future Part 1 watch Back to the Future Part 2? Uh, you know, do you, you know, what do you do with the current fans of your show rather than in bringing in completely new ones who don't even know what Back to the Future is. So maintaining relationship when there is no active phase of the campaign. Uh, so this is entertainment public relations process and this is again similar, the same concepts as the traditional public relations process that PRSA calls RPIE. As you can see, the process is the same. Whether we're talking about public relations in the corporate world or investor relations or media relations or community relations or entertainment industry, we still have to follow the same steps. But the actual tactics may be slightly different. And the problems that the industry is facing and the challenges the industry has at each of the steps of the public relations process may be slightly different. So research, for example, the first step of the public relations process, no matter what kind of acronym you use, as we talked about before, be it RPIE or RACES or ROBES or ROSIE, research in entertainment public relations has its own unique challenges. And they may be even different depending upon 
what subfield of entertainment public relations you work in. For example, on the TV side, and we're going to start with the TV side because that's probably one of the best examples, one of the challenges is how to measure the popularity of different TV shows. You know, the, the company sends a signal out and they have no idea who is watching it and if they're even watching it. So for years, it was a struggle and debate in the entertainment public relations industry, especially related to television, the quality of all these metrics. And Nielsen, uh, you probably, I don't know if you do, but if you heard about some, anything related to measuring a TV viewership, you probably heard about Nielsen ratings and Nielsen families. That was a dominant force of measuring TV ratings for years. And uh, some of you maybe even have received an envelope like that, uh, Nielsen uh, viewership rating. And inside that was something that's been a staple of measuring uh, of measuring TV viewership again for many, many years. Uh, famous Nielsen TV viewing diary. So the idea of the Nielsen TV viewing diary was that uh, they would send this diary to a family and they will ask them for a week to record their viewing habits. What exactly this family, this household was watching during the week. And the week would start on Thursday and it will end on Wednesday. And then on Thursday, it will be mailed back to Nielsen headquarters where they will calculate the viewership ratings for different TV shows. And so every day you are supposed to record. So there is a male head of household, female has a head of household, and there are spaces for other household members. And there is a time from uh, uh, early in the morning, 5 a.m. to uh, uh, late at night, 4 a.m., so the whole 24 hours, and you're supposed to record the station or channel name, for example, CBS, that's uh, uh, the name of the program or movie you're watching, um, uh, what's it, uh, The Big Bang Theory, for example, I'm trying to remember what's on CBS, um, and then who is watching and for how long they are watching. And this was extremely important piece of information, the most reliable piece of information, because based on that, they calculated the ratings for different TV shows. Based on that, there were decisions made what show stays, what show gets canceled. Based on that, it was decided how much money networks can charge for advertisements during different shows that they are uh, broadcasting. Based on that was decided how much the shows will be making money, how much the actors will be making money, directors, producers, whoever else was part of the uh, profit sharing of the, of the show. It was extremely important. But is it really accurate or reliable? And since the very beginning of the Nielsen ratings, there was discussions about if it can be trusted, but there was no other way. Uh, people were saying, well, nobody is actually, and there were interviews with people who were Nielsen families who were selected to do this, uh, this diary, that nobody is actually recording it as they're watching a TV show. They, you know, they have to send it out on Thursday. So Wednesday night or Thursday morning, right before mailing it, people would sit around it's like, oh my God, what did we watch? I don't remember. Did you watch it? Did you watch that? And they approximate. But Research requires information and you cannot do uh, any evaluation, any kind of measurement without data. And there was no other data. Then, of course, competitors appeared and said, well, that's ridiculous. Nobody, you know, can can rely on that. Uh, one of the most famous was Comscore and they came up, they, they came from the Internet site measuring the traffic to different websites. And they said, well, we can measure TV. We're just going to connect to the cable box and we're going to measure what is actually on TV. And Nielsen said, well, that may be good because we know that the TV is actually on, but we have no idea who's watching. What if the, somebody walked into the room, turned on the TV and left and the TV was just playing all day? Is it really any more reliable? 
It is different if there is a male head of household watching the show versus female head of household watching the show. Or even one person versus the whole family, five people. We don't know if we just measure what's on TV, who is exactly watching, or if anybody is even in the room. But again, Nielsen uh, uh, Diary, is it any better? What if you know, nobody even watched the show, but they just wrote it down because they read about it on TV and it was on the news when they were doing this, uh, um, this, uh, uh, this, this book. So they decided that maybe it's not good enough. Maybe we need to install a set-top box that's going to be recording what's on TV and also who is in front of the TV. So it's going to be scanning the room. That immediately brought some uh, uh, issues of uh, privacy. I mean, do you want a camera in your room recording when you're in front of the TV and when you are not in front of the TV? And then, of course, nowadays with uh, watching shows on the internet, watching shows uh, using uh, uh, DVRs, watching shows using some other technology that would not be captured by that. So Nielsen developed a new box that sits next to the TV and then it listens. It, it records whatever there is playing on TV or on the internet or even on radio and it records what is happening. Again, it's kind of like Alexa or uh, uh, Google uh, that's always listening and then sends the data to Nielsen again, but does it really know who is listening it even if there is somebody in the room? How reliable can that be? So these problems are unique to the entertainment public relations and this is what is being debated, being discussed. It's different from what is being discussed in corporate public relations world, for example, or the financial communication or media relations. Research is still the cornerstone of any public relations campaign of any planning because you need to know the starting point so that you know where to go from there. Uh, but the unique application, how exactly you measure it, and obviously diary is now looked as the something from the past and uh, 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 Nielsen completely changed the way it's doing things. It's now doing its Nielsen panels where you're invited to fill out an online survey, kind of similar to the beginning of the traditional Nielsen diary, uh, you know, what, how do you consume your TV? Is it, you know, satellite or cable? How many hours you typically watch? What are your favorite shows? What are your favorite channels? Obviously some demographic information. And then you are invited to, to complete those service from time to time. Um, there are now, um, you know, tracking of DVR recording. So it's live, if you watch something live, or is it live plus three? So you watched it within three days, so live plus seven, uh, uh, which is within seven days. Uh, if you watched it on um, the website of the network, for example, or using some other technology, Netflix, uh, Amazon, Hulu, all these different now uh, providers of uh, uh, TV and movies are now need to be included in order to have some accuracy in the ranking and measuring. So this is all challenging. This is all happening. Nobody has a perfect solution. There are many competitors. Well, not there are new competitors appearing to challenge the well-established ones such as uh, Nielsen and uh, uh, Comscore, for example, that recently merged with another company. So there is a lot of happening in the industry. There are unique, specific um, challenges that the entertainment industry is having. And, you know, the same applies to movies as well. How do you know what movie is popular, what movie is not popular? How do you measure that? Um, again, in the past, people go into a movie theaters. That was pretty easy to measure. But nowadays, uh, movies are often released up. It's becoming more common to release movies at the same time in movie theaters and on some streaming platform. Um, uh, uh, what people like, what people don't like, again, applying to uh, movies and uh, TV shows. I was lucky enough to visit CBS uh, Research Center uh, located in Las Vegas, uh, where you can preview new TV shows, maybe the ones that are still in the pilot stage or movies that will uh, see, uh, 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 that people would see in one year, two years, three years, maybe never. 
if the research concludes that they are not very popular. And you are allowed, you sign, obviously, after you sign all the confidentiality agreements that you never disclose it, people are uh, uh, being placed in front of the monitor where they are showing the content and there is a camera on top of that tracking their facial expression. Are people laughing? Are people crying? Are people bored? And if people are bored, then obviously that show probably is not going to make it. Um, it tracks your uh, eye uh, sight where exactly you are looking on the screen, what uh, part of the screen draws your attention, what part you're ignoring. A lot of data is being collected in order to uh, uh, create a show or green uh, light a, 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 a show or a movie because it is an, an expensive business and research again is a key foundation of that. And so again, when we're talking about uh, our class, when we're talking about the entertainment public relations industry, we have specific applications of taking the traditional public relations process and what's unique for each subfield of public relations. We're going to talk about research for TV, research for movies, research for music, and so on and so forth. Uh, then the next step is objectives or planning. If, you know, if you follow uh, uh, Rosie or um, ROBES, research objectives, if it's RPIE, it's planning. And uh, uh, traditionally in public relations, when we approach planning, we had three levels of planning, developing awareness, so that people know about the product or brand. Uh, attitude, that they liked and want this particular product or brand or political candidate or whatever else we're trying to promote. And then finally, action. So they act in the way we want them to act. Maybe they start conserving water. Maybe they're going to go buy the product. Maybe they're going to vote for a political candidate. And so in entertainment, you still follow the same concepts. You still need to develop awareness, you need still to develop attitude, and you need people to act in a certain way. So you still have three A's, awareness, attitude, action. But there is different terminology. In entertainment industry, it's common instead of awareness, say, boss. And I was always taught in, in corporate public relations, never use the word boss. It's, it's unprofessional, it's inappropriate, and it's meaningless. It has no meaning. But if you talk with people who work in the entertainment industry, they do have a meaning and they do equate bus with awareness. If people talk about a movie, if, talk, if people talk about a music band, this is the bus, this is the awareness, this is what you are trying to generate, this is what you are trying to create. And it's a foundation for everything else. Because if nobody is talking about the new song or the new artist, then what's the point? Nobody will care, nobody will buy it, they don't know about it. So generating buzz, although I was always taught in many traditional PR textbooks, I'd say, you know, you never use that term, it's unprofessional. In entertainment PR, it is quite common. And uh, uh, throughout this class, we have interviews with the public relations professionals who actually work in the entertainment PR industry. You will hear that they do use this term and they are not shy of using the term as well. And then attitude, when we talked about uh, developing attitude, you know, entertainment PR, they say hype. And again, there are some negative connotations about using the word hype and in traditional public relations textbook, it would say, you know, we never use the term hype, it's inappropriate. But hype is people liking something, people thinking that something is great, something is unique, something is worth uh, their time. And so in entertainment public relations field, the word attitude quite often gets replaced with the word hype. So they're generating buzz and they're creating hype or they're hyping up a product. And there is nothing necessarily wrong with that. It's just the unique terminology, unique approach of the entertainment public relations industry. And another thing I want to mention is the people who really enjoy entertainment public relations, the people who uh, uh, dedicated their careers to entertainment public relations. Sometimes they even say that all public relations is really entertainment public relations. Several of uh, books on the history of public relations, they start the history of public relations with P.T. Barnum. In some textbook, P.T. Barnum is called the father of public relations, so grandfather of public relations. And what he did was the entertainment public relations. On the other hand, there are many people 
again in the public relations, especially academic world, who are saying that studying the history of public relations from P.T. Barnum does a great disservice to the entertainment, to public relations in general, because he was associated with a lot of lies and misleading statements and uh, uh, some even assigned the phrase that there is a sucker born every minute to P.T. Barnum, although, you know, no historical accounts actually confirm that, that he actually said that. Uh, uh, rather, it was probably said about him and about his tactics. In all the actual statements from him, he actually has a tremendous respect for the people uh, who participate in his events. Although they are often lies and fakes, he believed that he provides entertainment and people realize that these are hoaxes or jokes but they enjoy it because everybody wanted entertainment. So, um, although again, there is a sucker born every minute is commonly attributed to P.T. Barnum, there is no really proof that he actually said it. And in fact, it's in contradiction to many other statements he said. But P.T. Barnum started with the museum, uh, uh, traveling theater, traveling circus. So traditional entertainment field. And he is famous for generating a lot of publicities, a lot of scandals. Uh, he tried to use, he did pioneer a lot of the public relations tactics successfully. He also is often credited with creating the celebrity culture in the United States when he brought Jenny Lind uh, uh, um, in the United States, a famous opera singer. And uh, there was no culture of opera, nobody knew about Jenny Lind. But before she even arrived, he invested so much money into generating her celebrity status that by the time she actually got here, there was thousands of people greeting her just by him using the media and promoting her before she arrived. He was able to make enormous amount of money, uh, amount of money on her concerts in the United States. He is considered to be the king of publicity. He generated events just in order to generate publicity, one of the most Famous was the Brooklyn Bridge Parade when the Brooklyn Bridge was built. Um, there was real concern that it's not safe enough. It was a, a, a ginormous creation um, at the time and people didn't really trust that they were afraid of it. And he was able to help Brooklyn Bridge and himself by organizing a parade of all the you know, animals and people he had in his circus across the Brooklyn Bridge, uh, uh, including multiple elephants that were very, very famous uh, uh, at the time uh, and, you know, weighing more than 10,000 pounds or whatever it was. And they paraded all at the same time across the Brooklyn Bridge, proving to everybody that it's safe. And that was in every newspaper. It was a topic of conversation of everybody for several days, weeks, maybe even months. And that brought a lot of people to his uh, uh, museum uh, theater. Uh, people got excited about it. So this may be somewhat positive example. There were several that were not uh, a very positive. Uh, uh, George Washington Nurse, one of his famous, uh, one of his earliest creation where he paraded uh, an old uh, African-American woman who uh, she claimed was over 150 years old because she was a nurse to George Washington. And um, he was selling tickets for people to look at her. And after she died, he actually was doing live autopsy of her and he was selling tickets to people to attend the live autopsy and then obviously it was discovered that she wasn't really 180 she was way younger than that and she was never george washington yours but it doesn't matter he said it was all in a good joke and then another example is fiji mermaid where it was uh, he created a fake mermaid where it was the top part of the monkey and the bottom part of the fish and they were sewn together and he claimed it's a real mermaid but you know when pressed on that he said well everybody understands it's a joke so it's not really a big deal um, you know it's a joke uh, general tom thumb another maybe not such a um, positive example where he took a young a uh, boy, I believe, when uh, he started, it, he was only four years old and he taught him to smoke and drink and curse 
and said that it's a grown uh, person uh, uh, and dress him as a grown man and uh, have him perform on stage and do all the smoking and drinking and people, uh, uh, you know, showcase that, call that person General Tom Thumb uh, and showed it as if it's an, an adult. Um, he is credited with creating a lot of different contests, so the beauty contest, obviously, but also other contests like the uh, um, whatever you can imagine here, the uh, uh, contest uh, for. Um, and uh, uh, probably my favorite example is when uh, his greatest show on Earth, uh, although that referred to circuits, but uh, uh, when his museum became so popular that people would go there for the whole day, they would buy a ticket and they go in and they stick in there, he couldn't figure out the way to get them out and so he uh, created a secret exhibit called Egress, which simply means exit, and he took the door and wrote in big letters Egress over it and he even charged people additional money on top of the ticket to the museum to go see a grass and after they paid and they went through the door and the door closed behind them, they were left on the street. So that's the most creative way to get people out and some people got upset but he said most people really enjoyed it of how um, smart and tricky he was to get them out of the museum. So all this maybe not a very <laughs> positive example. So there was a mix of good stuff like introducing people to opera, creating celebrities, uh, uh, promoting the safety of a Brooklyn Bridge and then very negative uh, um, examples. And again, there is a debate in the public relations industry. Is P.T. Barnum the father of public relations and then is entertainment PR basically the foundation of all public relations because we started with P.T. Barnum and then others are saying no, do not do not count P.T. Barnum as PR. He was unethical, he was lying, he was cheating. Uh, it's not public relations at all and the reason public relations has negative connotations is because we are, you know, keeping people like P.T. Barnum among our founders that we should abandon P.T. Barnum completely. So this is a debate. Uh, there is, uh, 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 it's up to you to decide uh, what you want to believe, but definitely P.T. Barnum is, uh, uh, was an entertainer and uh, pioneered a lot of the entertainment public relations tactics.